But the dog is the emblem of fidelity. There will be no more dogs at Castle Carefall. But I have never betrayed you. You cannot punish a dumb animal for a crime you think I have committed. I will hear no more of this. Oh, but you will, my lord. Someday you will. And then, too late, my lord, you will wish this terrible deed undone. Our mystery drama, Castle Kerfold, was especially adapted from the Edith Wharton classic for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by all state insurance companies and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I doubt if very many of us have ever gone or ever will go shopping for a castle. But if any of you do, there's one important thing to remember. One vital question to ask. Does the castle have a ghost? And if it does, what are its ghostly habits? This was a question which Paula Randall never bothered to ask. And this is what happened to her on her first look at the graceful turrets of Castle Kerfold. A sudden, uncontrollable chill was my first reaction to the sight of the proud roofs and gables of Castle Kerfold. My second reaction was one of confusion mixed with a touch of anger. What in the world was I doing standing outside the iron gate leading to the obviously empty courtyard of a medieval castle? Did I really want to buy this? Or had I been talked into something? I could hear the pleasant voice of my host, Henri Lanrevin, saying, You really should buy Castle Kerfall, Polos. You would make a perfect hostess for that ancient manor. And it wouldn't be at all a bad thing for your business if you owned the most romantic house in Brittany. Oh, I don't think a great many people will come all the way to Brittany just to see a fashion show. Nonsense. People would travel half around the world to catch a glimpse of the breathtaking new Paula Randall fashion. <laughs> Spoken like a gallant Frenchman. Uh -huh. But with more gallantry than truth, I'm afraid. However, I will make an admission to you, Henri. I am beginning to want roots to settle down somewhere. You really must see Castle Kilfall today. And today is perfect. I'm driving on to Camp Air. You stay here and look around. I'll pick you up on my way back. The caretaker or his wife will show you around. And so he left. And I suppose I was annoyed because I couldn't see anyone around. And no one came to answer the bell. I tugged at it again. Still no sign of anyone. I pushed open the iron gate and stepped into the stone courtyard and I stopped. I was facing the main building and now I could see that this was a mere shell, a ruined front through which the trees of the park beyond were clearly visible. But the rest of the house was still in its original splendid beauty. And as I started for the main door, suddenly a dog barred my way. He was such a very beautiful little dog that for a moment he made me forget the splendid place he was defending. He was golden brown, silken-haired Pekingese, and there was anger in his large brown eyes. But to my surprise, he didn't snap or bark. He gradually stepped back as I stepped forward. And then I noticed another dog a rough, brindled mongrel who limped on a lame leg. I remember thinking, why, there will be trouble now, as the first two animals were joined by a third, a white dog with long hair who'd slipped out of a doorway. He was silently watching me. And so we stood, the dogs and I, watching each other. And then I decided to make friends. I stooped to pat the little Pekingese. He didn't bark or growl or take his eyes from me. He simply moved back slowly on noiseless paws and continued to stare at me. 
as did the other dogs. I felt very uneasy. And I called to them. Do you know what you dogs look like? All of you? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. That's just how you look. Paula, I hope you haven't been waiting here long. I thought you'd be up at the castle or with the caretaker. There are no caretakers. What? I don't understand. The family are anxious to sell the place. The caretaker or his wife should be around. What can have happened? I don't know, but I saw no one. Well, I must apologize. I never would have had you go. If no, no, I... no, no apology necessary. Even if I could have gotten in, I suspect the dogs would have stopped me. What did you say about dogs? Oh, yes. There were several dogs. They seemed to have the place to themselves. <laughs> you mean you actually saw them? Oh, you can't miss them. I saw nothing else. How many? I've always wondered. Ali, don't tell me you've never been to Castle Careful. Often, but never on this day. What day? Well, I'd quite forgotten. If I'd remembered, Paula, believe me, I never would have brought you today. There is a story that goes with Castle Kerfall, an unpleasant tale. As a matter of fact, an ancestor of mine named André Lanrivain was mixed up in it. You know, every Breton house has its ghost story. What on earth is that to do with the dog? Uh, those dogs are the ghosts of Kerfall. Oh, come on, Henri. Oh, yes. <laughs> Do you expect me to believe that? I don't expect you to believe anything. But you told me you saw a lot of dogs. And I know there isn't a single dog at Castle Kerfall. At dinner that night, there was no more talk of Castle Kerfall. But after the guests had left and Henri's mother had said good night, he brought me a shabby leather-bound volume from an upper shelf in his library. Yeah. I think you should read this. What is he? Oh, you see. Uh-huh. A History of the Assizes of the Duchy of Brittany. Compare. 1702? Mm-hmm. And this book was written about 100 years after the affair at Castle Carrefour. But I believe the account is taken almost literally from the judicial record. There was a trial? Yes. And a rather strange one. And my old ancestor, André de Longuevin, figures in it. And the dogs, Henri, where do they come in? Read it. And if you should be too frightened to continue, just yell, and I shall come galloping to the rescue. I read until well past midnight, completely absorbed, caught up in this strange transcript of what took place in a courtroom over 400 years ago. But on this night, every word rang as clearly as if I were sitting there, listening to the judge, questioning the young and beautiful Anne de Cournot, the lovely young bride of the 62-year-old baron, Yves de Cournot, the master of Careful Castle. The prisoner must understand that if this court is to arrive at the truth, the prisoner must give us, in as much detail as she can remember, the entire history of her marriage to the Baron. I understand, Your Lordship. What is it you wish to know? The court has heard testimony from various witnesses about the first two years of your marriage to Yves de Cournot. But what puzzles me is how you and the Baron met. My father took me to the holy shrine at Locrono. We were seeking absolution, doing penance for our sins. And that was where the Baron first saw me. And... And? He was smitten with me. Well, how do you know that? Because, Your Lordship, it was less than a week later that he came to my father's house with pack mules laden with gifts for my father and for me. And he asked for my hand. Now proceed, madame. Castle Careful was a very lonely place. And when my husband was away on his business matters, I was alone. 
It was my very deep sorrow that our marriage was childless, though there was never a word of reproach from my husband. In short, madame, you would have the court believe that yours was an idyllic union with never a quarrel between you? No. No, your lordship, we quarreled. But only over matters of small import. Perhaps madame can recreate for us one of the quarrels of small import? Yes, your lordship. It was after one of my husband's business trips. He came to me in the garden immediately upon his return. Well, it is suitable and pleasing to me to find my wife in her garden picking flowers. I am happy to please, my lord. Oh, come on. My name is Eve. And it is Eve who has brought a pretty bauble for your neck. Here, open it. Oh, it is beautiful. It's magnificent. And I thank you. Ah, you are a beautiful creature, my Anne. I missed you. Then why do you not take me with you? I should not be so lonely then. The city is no fit place for young wives. Why do you find it so irksome here at Castle Kerfall while I'm away? Oh, it isn't irksome, but I feel I am a prisoner here. I cannot even pick a flower in my garden without having a waiting woman at my heels. Wherever I go here, I am watched. You are protected and honored. From whom do I need to be protected? And I am not a queen that I need such honors. A man who has a treasure like you at home, man, does not leave the key in the lock when he goes abroad. And this, your lordship, was the only point of contention between us. Until... Until... <laughs> I'm sorry. My apologies to the court and to your lordship. But these memories are sometimes very painful for me. When my husband returned from his following journey, he brought me a gift. The one I loved the best it was a small brown silken Chinese dog that he'd purchased from a sailor at Bordeaux. Perhaps it was true that I loved that little dog in place of the child I never had. But Eve seemed pleased that I was so fond of Xinhua. I named him that. And the little dog and I were inseparable. And one day, when I'd fallen asleep in my room with Xinhua at my feet, I noticed it. What's this? Well, what have you done with my magnificent necklace? Do I see it around the neck of a dog? Oh, Eve. I'm sorry if you're angry that I used the necklace in such a foolish fashion. Oh, well, not at all, my dear. I know how much you love Shinwa, and it is a compliment to me that you place one of my presents around the other's neck. Oh, thank you, Eve. That was not the reason I woke you. I had to tell you that I was struck by your resemblance to my great-grandmother, Julianne de Corneau, lying in the chapel with her feet on a little dog. Oh, you do not like the thought? Well, it is somewhat uncomfortable. Still, perhaps when I am dead, you might place me beside her, also carved in marble with my dog at my feet. You shall have your monument if you earn it. And I swear I shall be faithful with my little Xinhua at my feet. And you were not faithful. You were discovered. And you took your revenge by killing the Baron. No. No, Your Lordship. I have said that I am not an adulteress. I swear that I am not. Andre was my friend. My dear friend. He was a man who was not as cruel as my husband, but he was no more than a friend. Do you deny that you met him secretly the night your husband was killed? I have never denied that. Then why did you go meet him secretly at midnight if it were not to commit adultery? I went to ask him to take me away because I was certain that my husband was going to kill me. What a 
difference in lifestyle three or four centuries make. Today, if a woman commits adultery, she's just as likely to write a book detailing her experiences. In the 17th century, a husband would have been allowed to kill an unfaithful wife. I'll be back with Act Two in just a moment. see ghosts differ from people who see UFOs. The latter can't wait to tell the world that they have seen these strange, glowing, elliptical-shaped objects floating around our planet, while those who have seen ghosts are somehow reluctant to mention the fact. Of course, the lady in today's tale was thoroughly convinced that what she had seen were simply a number of dogs, not ghosts at all. But... This belief was under severe strain. I had become so involved in reading the trial of Anne de Cornot, recorded so completely in the ancient and crumbling book, The History of the Assizes of the Duchy of Brittany, that I didn't even hear Henri's rapping at my door. Anne! Anne, are you all right? Oh, I'm sorry, Henri. I was lost in a courtroom 400 years ago with that poor frightened girl, Anne de Cournot. Well, how do you like my ancestor, André? Well, so far he's only been mentioned briefly, but really I am haunted with Anne, with the girl. I feel chilled as I read her testimony. I feel as though I were she there in the court sometimes. I even know what she's going to say before she says it. It, it, it. It's scary, Henri. Well, then stop reading. Oh, no. No, not a chance. Not after I saw those dogs today. You were joking, weren't you, when you said there weren't any dogs at Castle Carrefour? No, Anne, I wasn't. There are no dogs at Carrefour. After Henri left me, I returned to the book and immediately found myself back in the 17th century courtroom, so involved that I actually seemed to be living the tortured life of that poor girl, now dead some 400 years. You ask us to believe that your husband would have given you permission to journey to St. Barbe? Yes, your lordship. The pilgrimage was made in the company of a lady much respected by the baron. The lady, his aged aunt, and I were on a journey to Sambab. It was a religious pilgrimage. Well, does it not seem almost doubly sinful for a woman to meet a paramour on a religious pilgrimage? Andre de Longrevin was never my paramour. I'd seen him once or twice at Castle Carrefour when he visited there with his father, but he never exchanged more than civil greetings with me. And thus, what he said to me at St. Bob was a shock to me and a surprise. And scandalous? No. I did not think so. We met by chance under the aspen trees as the procession was coming out of the chapel. I pity you. He said... And I was surprised because I had no thought that anybody considered me an object of pity. He said no more? Only one thing. Call me when you need me. As an ear to listen. And a mouth to talk. As I've said, my husband was away a great deal. My life at Castle Careful was indeed lonely. My little dog, Chinois, was always with me. And he gave me great pleasure... But more and more I thought of the meeting with André de la Revin and of his words. And one day I decided to test him to ascertain whether he meant what he said. Of all the maids my husband had serving me, there was one I trusted more than the others. And it was she I sent with a note, certain that there would be no answer. But I was wrong. And he was waiting in the copse near the edge of the forest. As his note said he would be. Milady, you came after all. It was I who sent for you. And you thought I would not be here. I dared not hope. Andre. I feel you have no life at all with the Baron. 
your, your gentleness and beauty is not for him. Where are you going? No, I see now. It was not only foolish, but it was wrong of me to have come Please, here. Please, milady, don't go. Just tell me what you want from me. And you shall have it. There must never be a discussion of my husband. He shall not be mentioned. Agreed. That is a beautiful little dog you have in your arms. Yes, I love him very much. He was a gift from the Baron. I see. Which was very thoughtful. But much as I love my little Chinois, I admit to loneliness. I long to hear a human voice other than my mate's. If my voice will help, you shall hear it as often as you wish. And uh, how often did you meet? Twice more, your lordship, and each time very briefly. And your husband knew nothing of these meetings? I have reason to believe he did not. You see, at the time of our second meeting, I had already realized that we must put an end to it. But there must be a reason. Surely I deserve at least that from you, Anne. Some reason why we should no longer meet. Because I do not wish it. If there's one thing I know, it's that you have enjoyed our conversations as much as I. Perhaps more. You've told me so. No, never. Well, perhaps not in so many words. But I can tell. By the flush on your cheek. The spark that kindles in your eyes when I tell you of Paris and other cities I've seen. No, no, no. What you have just said is reason enough why we must no longer meet. I find myself looking forward to it too much. I know it will be like a drug to me. And the more meetings we have, the more I shall want. I must stop now while I can. But we have done nothing wrong. Committed no sin in the eyes of the Lord. Thank you, Andre, for the moments of light you have given me. I shall always be grateful. But we can meet no more. But you did. And why? What changed your mind? A message from him, your lordship, saying that he was going away for a long, long time, and he asked for only one farewell meeting. If I knew you would come to bid me farewell whenever I leave the country, then I should try to leave every day. Andre, where are you going? When do you leave? I go to the British Isles on some business which is not without peril. I shall be away for six or seven months. Would you not give me some keepsake? Something of small value to you, but which I will cherish always, since it will speak to me of you during the long months of separation? Well, gladly. I would give what you ask, but I brought no jewels. I wear no rings. I have no trinkets. And then, though I knew it was wrong... I took the small necklace from around the throat of little Chinois and I offered it to Andre. At first he refused, but I urged. No, I insisted. And finally he took it. And afterwards I was sorry. And that very night at dinner with my husband. Well, your little dog has a giant appetite, my love. You mustn't spoil him. By overfeeding. Better overfeeding than overpetting the way you do. <laughs> well, here, here. Come here, Chinois. Here, here, here. Here's a piece of meat. There. <laughs> Good dog. <laughs> well done. What's this? Where is his necklace? Oh, he... He lost it. Lost it? He was running in the park, in the undergrowth. And when I picked him up, I noticed that the necklace was gone. I spent a good time during the day searching for it, but I couldn't find it. Well, perhaps it will be found one day. Have some more wine, madame. It's an excellent vintage. No, thank you. Then I shall drink alone. Are you uh, interested in hearing about my day in Ren? If my lord will excuse me, I have a slight headache. I should like to retire. But of course, of course. I have my bottle for company, and you... <laughs> when you get to your room, you will have your little dog. Oh, Mon pauvre. Ma 
my little seal. <laughs> Madame, there is something wrong, something troubling you. Oh, she was. He is dead. <laughs> now, how did that? Dead. <laughs> now, how did that happen? I came into my room and I found him like this, lying across my pillows. Someone has strangled him. A pity, madame. But there is a bright side to every tragedy, eh? You see? Here, your necklace has been found. Found? Would to heaven it had not been. Oh, take it away, my lord. I never want to see it again. After the use to which it's been put, wound round my little dog's throat. To snuff out his life. Madam, I'm displeased that you smile so little. I'm sorry, my lord. I shall try. No, 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 nonsense. I have arranged for some entertainment at Castle Carthol when I go next to Camper on business. Entertainment, I think, that will please you. That is very kind of you, my lord. You are so selfish of me. I would like to see some small measure of life appear in a wife who is at least 40 years younger than I am. Yes, my lord. And so for two days while I am at Camp Air, I have given the gypsies permission to come here. And in return, they promise to put on some <laughs> entertainments for you. Let us hope, madame, they serve to put you in better spirits. Oh, it's lovely. It's so lovely. And the dogs are wonderful. Tell me, does it take you long to train them? Uh, not too long, milady. Uh, the ones who are trained uh, help me with the ones who have to learn. Oh, look, this one, this one is the dearest, I think. Am I mistaken? Or does he have one blue and one brown eye? <laughs> milady has a sharp eye. Uh, and he seems to like you. Yes. Would you... I mean, would it be much trouble for you to train another dog if Milady wants to buy the little dog. Of oh. course. For three golden coins, you may have the dog. Oh, thank you very much. I'll have one of my maids get you the coins. Have you taught your maids to lie to me, madame? I cannot understand your question, my lord. When I returned to Castle Carfall this evening, they told me you enjoyed the gypsy entertainment I arranged for you. That you were gay and bright with laughter. And yet for me, there's only silence. I am sorry, my lord. Do I have my lord's permission to go to my room? Very well. I shall return, my lord, immediately. I hope in a more cheerful disposition than heretofore. Oh, no. no. What is it? Oh. What is around you? Oh, it's my little dog. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I see he has been strangled. <laughs> it would seem, madame, that you have bad luck with your pets. <laughs> Everyone knows that the ASPCA represents the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. There is, however, no ASPCM, which could stand for the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Mates. Perhaps if there were such a society, there might be fewer divorces, and even more important, fewer husband-wife murders. We'll be back with Act Three in just a moment. It's a scientific fact that some people have a low threshold of pain. 
while others can withstand a remarkable amount of punishment before they even feel the slightest twinge. It would seem to me only logical that some people would be more sensitive to the influences and specters of the past and would find themselves powerfully affected by merely hearing or reading about past events. So I completely understand the reaction of our very modern, liberated 20th century Paula Randall to the events in the La Rivain Chateau in Brittany. I have been reading for hours. And I suppose I made a fool of myself later that night with my behavior. But there were extenuating circumstances. Earlier, I had told Henri de Langredin how much I had identified with the girl, with Anne de Cournon, whose trial I was reading about. And I had just reached the part where she found her second little dog strangled. And suddenly, the lights in my room went out. I didn't panic, not then. But I had been reading in bed, and in the dark, I reached for the bedside table to find a match to strike a light. And my hand felt something soft and furry. And it was then that I screamed and screamed and woke the house and brought Henri bursting through my door. Paula, Paula, what is it? What has happened? The dog. Henri, her dead little dog. It was next to my bed. I felt it. Nonsense. There's nothing here. Ah, look. It's one of your bedroom slippers with a fur on it. Look for yourself. Well, I can't see it in the dark. Why did those lights go out? It's almost dawn. We switch back from the emergency generator now. And there are about ten minutes during which we're without electricity. Of course, not many people are usually up at this hour. I'm sorry, but I was so frightened. Henri, why did you give me this book, this history of the trials of the Duchy of Brittany? Why did you want me to read this? No ulterior motives, my pet. I thought you'd be interested in buying Castle Kerfal. I wanted you as a neighbor. And then you saw the dogs. That that clinched it. Yes, but other people must see them. You told me the caretaker and his wife leave on that particular day, so... Well, they live here. They have ties. What are you saying? Perhaps you shouldn't finish. No, no. You go now. And apologize to the household for my behavior. And we will have coffee after I finish reading. Henri was disturbed, but he left. And I went back again to the history of the assizes of the Duchy of Brittany. And again, the ancient words on the printed page worked their magic. And I was transported back in time to that drafty courtroom. And, uh, did it not occur to you to confront your husband and ask him if he was indeed responsible for killing the dogs? And if so, what were his reasons? I felt that would be useless. Why useless? You did not know the Baron, your lordship. I hoped that by my telling this story, you would come to know something of the mind of a man who could kill innocent animals simply because he imagined that his name had been dishonored. We have only your word that it was his imagination. And the word of André de la Rivain. Who may have been your accomplice. Finish your testimony. There's little more to tell. I suffered in my loneliness and the winter wore on and then the gypsies returned. But Milady has not bought anything. Nothing at all. No. I'm not in the mood for buying. Not even for buying happiness? No one can buy happiness. Hey, to the gypsy, many things are possible that are not known by you, madame. Take, for instance, this pear-shaped pendant. This is a most remarkable trinket, Milady. Yes, it looks very nice. This pendant can tell the future and bring happiness. Oh, nonsense. Of course. But uh, the trinket is pretty and an exceptional bargain. For you, milady, this will be only two livres. No, I am not. Look, interested. it is so cunningly contrived. See, it opens. A cunning contrivance. And wait, 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 wait. It's wait, yours. Wait a moment. 
Wasn't there a piece of paper in it? It is yours, milady. You will not regret it. No, that paper. I saw it. It had the long river seal. I uh, did not notice. Uh, no, milady, I should not open it here. Uh, the privacy of your chamber would be more suitable. My dear lady, I have returned. I must see you. I will be at the side door of the castle after midnight. The Baron has told me he is staying the night in Rand, Andre. Yes. I have returned, madam. Oh, no. And I would like your presence at supper. Oh, good Lord. What am I to do now? It is a pleasant surprise to find you back tonight, my husband. I gather your business in Rand went so well that you could return so soon? It went as I expected. My lord, tell me some of the interesting things that happened to you in Rome. Madame, I find your prattle boring, and this evening it is I who have the headache. I also feel feverish. Is there something I can do? A poultice, perhaps? You can keep quiet. Good night, madame. I trust you sleep well. There's nothing to disturb pleasant dreams. And so, your lordship, I returned to my room, terrified. I was certain that in some way my husband had found out about Andre, and that he would be there waiting at the side door, and that he would kill Andre and me. I waited in my room, but then I opened my door and stole along the passage and listened at my husband's door. I could hear him breathing heavily and with difficulty, but I was still fearful. And I went back to my room and I waited until the moon had set through the trees of the park. And then I went back again and listened at the door to my husband's room. He still seemed to be asleep. I had only two thoughts. To get down the stairs silently, to get to the door, to unbolt it, and warn Andre, tell him that I wished him to take me away. I reached the door and unbolted it and opened it. Anne, I must tell you... Andre, you must go. He has come back. I think because he knew that you were coming. Please go. Go now. But Anne, I... I want to go away with you, but not now. Go, go now. And these noises you heard from your husband's room were after you had dismissed de Lariva and closed the castle door? Yes, your lordship. What did you do next? I started up the stairs and I listened. What did you hear? I heard dogs snarling and panting. What dogs? Huh? What dogs? I don't know. And how long did you remain listening on the stairs? Just a few minutes. And then when I reached the room, it was dark. And I found my husband's flint and steel. And I struck a spark for the candle. And when I saw him lying there, dead. And the dogs? The dogs were gone. Gone? Where to? I don't know. There was no way for them to get out. And we had no dogs at Castle Careful. You would have us believe, madame, that your husband was killed by a pack of invisible dogs? Oh, if it please your lordship, the bites which caused the death of Baron de Cornu were clearly visible at the inquest. Well, madame... Can you give the court any idea of where the supposed dogs came from? My dead dog. Mine. The dogs he killed so cruelly for no reason. My dead dogs. A 20th century sun was brightening every corner of my room when I'd finished and put down the history of the trial of Anne de Cournot 
And I sat there thinking I was emotionally drained. When Henri de Longueville knocked at my door. Yes, come here. Ah, you look beautiful. But you seem terribly worried, my lovely Paula. Henri, you can forget about my dying castle, Tefo. I would not want to live there now if someone gave it to me. Oh, but Sherry, what you read happened 400 years ago. People were different. Henri, you forget. I saw those dogs today. I knew nothing of all this, and yet I saw those dogs today. Do you think I could even consider living there, knowing what happened to that poor girl and a Gonneau? Well, as a matter of fact, Paula, you realize she got off quite easily for a woman accused of murder in those days. Easily? She was paroled to the de Cournot family. She spent the rest of her life shut up in Castle Carefall. Uh, this has really gotten under your skin. Do you know, Henri, I think I have been fooling myself about wanting to settle down? I really hadn't told Henri the truth. I told him only half the truth. I saw the dogs at Castle Carefall. I couldn't understand why I should have seen them unless it was a warning to me. At least I took it to be so. And thus for me, Castle Carefall will remain a haunting, a disturbing, and an unresolved memory. I was impressed with this story of Castle Kerfoe and the dogs and told it to a psychiatrist friend of mine. When I finished, he smiled the smile of a man who has all the answers and said, it's amazing to what lengths a woman will go to avoid facing up to the fact that she's really afraid of marriage. He believed that. Do you? I'll be back shortly. If two bits equal one quarter. Before I return tomorrow, I think I should tell you the world's shortest horror story. I hope you haven't heard it. It goes like this. After the atomic holocaust, there's only one man left in the world. He knows that everyone else has been killed. As he sits alone in his bomb shelter, suddenly there comes a knock at the door. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, William Redfield, Ian Martin, and Guy Sorrell.